there's still plenty of seats if you'd like to join the classroom. Okay. All right. I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. And you guys are ready for the last couple weeks of school before Christmas break. Um, we've got a lot going on. First off, I hope you guys all know this by now, you've got an exam this week in your skills lab. Um, so please make sure that you review your skills lab notes and review the textbook and be ready to take that test. Okay. Um, your final oral presentations are in your lab next week, as is, well not in your lab, but checkpoint five is next week also. So you need a fully functioning, propelling itself hovercraft. Um, it's going to be Wednesday and Thursday between 10 and 5. So just like checkpoint four, um, you guys have got that going next week. Your final report is coming up, not next week, but the week after, I believe. And then you have some extra credit. Everyone's been saying, what can I do to get some extra points in here? Please go to Web Campus, and on the left column, there is a link called Food for Thought. Okay. Dr. Lacombe, myself, and the TAs have posted videos, and they have short questions that you can answer after them. You can do as many of them as you want, or do none at all, but it's a nice opportunity for you guys to get extra credit on your own volition. It's not dependent on your team. So um, please take a look at that. There's some really good videos. They're very interesting. Um, last but not least, the honors section. You guys have, as promised, an extra assignment to do. That assignment is going to be due, I believe, three weeks from today. You guys will learn more about it in your skills lab, but you're essentially you're creating a video or a poster of some sort to advertise this class. Um, so please check that out on Web Campus. Look at the requirements so you can ask questions. Okay. Any questions about what's coming up? All right. Okay, so your final oral presentation, you have between 8 and 10 minutes. At 12 minutes, you will be cut off, pushed off the stage, move on for someone else. So please time yourselves and practice, practice, practice. You can look at chapter 12 in your book. Okay. Um, also, I w if I were you, I would look at my grade sheet from the previous presentation and make sure you address any issues that you had before to fix those. Um, also, look at the grading rubric. It has changed from the first presentation. Checkpoint five, again, you need to have your propulsion system fully functioning. Okay? There will be no penalties, as there are for the final competition, but you need to get into the turnaround zone and come back. So you've got to complete the entire course. Okay? So please start thinking about that. Again, next Wednesday and Thursday, 10 to 5. So it's the end of the semester. Things are coming quickly. Um, please be prepared for all of that. Five bonus points if you get it on your first attempt, and otherwise you have five minutes. Anybody questions? No one? Yes. What's that? Penalty is not enforced, he asked. What does that mean? It means that you can hit the wall. <laughs> you can drop yourself in the, in the end zone. The things, read the grade sheet, please. But things that you can not do in the final competition, like touch the wall, you can do for checkpoint five. OK. Anybody else? All righty. So I've got a clicker question for you guys today. Which engineering field interests you the second most? So we know your major, but we want to know what interests you the second most. Your options are, which we have at UNR, biomedical engineering, civil engineering, chemical engineering, computer science and engineering, electrical engineering, environmental engineering, material science, mechanical engineering, or I don't know. Um, let me get this started for you guys. All right, ready, go. All right, about 15 seconds. Get in your answers, quick, quick, quick. Second most desirable engineering field. Five seconds. 310 responses, 12. OK, let's take a look. So we've got 14% biomedical. Yay. Um, let's see, computer science and engineering, 22%. You guys enjoyed their presentation last week? Yeah? OK, 14% electrical, 13% mechanical. Good. All right, chemical, five. Material seven. OK, good to know. All right, so today, this is what we've been doing for Mondays here. 
Um, we've got guest speakers from chemical and materials engineering. Um, Dr. Chidambaram and Dr. Fuchs are here to talk to you guys. So they each get 20 minutes. Please give them your best attention. Um, they have a lot of good things to say about their department, and it might spark your interest. So um, please give them your attention. Thank you. All right. Can you guys hear me okay? Good. Did you guys have a good Thanksgiving? That's not enthusiastic. Come on, let's hear it. Good. Good. Um, all right, I'm Dave Chidambaram, and I'm going to introduce you guys to material science and engineering. So we'll go over what is material science and engineering. I'll give you some examples. I'll tell you why it's an important topic, why it's an important field. And then if you guys have any questions, you can ask me about this. So if I were to say, so if I were to say that our entire civilization is defined by our access to materials, will that statement be an overstatement or an understatement? Or just about right? Show of hands. It's an overstatement. It's an understatement. Okay? And how many of you think that's about right? All right. But I guess only these people can hear me. <laughs> I'm not getting any responses from either the right or the left. Um, okay, how do you know civilization and what we have access to materials defines our civilization? So if you go in our history, we have been defined by Stone Age, Bronze Age, Steel Age, and now maybe the Silicon Age. This is all based on materials. When we had access to materials, that defines how advanced our civilization is, how our quality of life depends on our access to materials. What we happens next and where we go from here, once again, is defined by your materials, access to your materials. And who makes these materials? Material scientists, materials engineers come up with these new materials. And that's the whole field of material science. And did you guys also know that this is the oldest form of engineering, starting from pottery? Material science engineering, not mechanical, not electrical, not biomedical. And I also noticed that there are 13% of students said that your second interest is mechanical engineering, and I'm assuming that's the ones whose major is not mechanical engineering. Most of you probably are mechanical engineers here. How many of you are undecided majors in engineering? No undecided? One. Two, wow. So why are materials important? Let's see what happened just two weeks ago. There was Chevron shut down a pipeline because it corroded and it leaked. And this has happened in the history and it will probably happen again in future. It is something that keeps on happening pretty much every month. Pipelines corrode, pipelines fail, bridges fail. These things happen. Why do they happen? Because materials fail. And what does the material science and what happens when materials fail? It can be catastrophic. And any Giants fans here? Yeah, three. Wow. <laughs> OK, let's see. Can you identify this guy? Hunter Pence, what game was this? World Series, no. Game 7, NLCS. Inning 3, broken bat. Three times he touched it. But that bat failed. That's a material. And that failure of that material actually helped him in this case because the ball was not hit hard enough. And they scored three runs in that five-run third inning, which, because of which they won game seven. So again, not all materials failures are the result in catastrophic or loss of life. Some of them actually help people. Why should you consider material science engineering? Your average annual salaries that you get after you graduate with a bachelor's is about 54000 with a PhD, it's close to $80,000.
as opposed to all other graduates, which starts around $46,000. So financially, material science makes sense. What is material science engineering? After saying all these things, we want to define it. It's an interdisciplinary field, and probably the only field in this college which actually interfaces with every one of the other engineering fields. And today's talk will focus on giving you examples in each one of these engineering fields that's actually defined by materials. So you could be actually doing a major in civil or in nuclear, and your entire work could be based on materials if you're a graduate student. I'm not going to go too much into this. I know Dr. Lacombe is a fan of this, and he probably has actually talked about this in this class. Um, I know he usually does, but this is a, a Helios. It's unmanned solar cell powered vehicle, and you guys know what it's made of. What is it made of? Solar cells, and what else is it made of? It's really light. Carbon materials, okay. Composites. Aerospace engineering. You're still bomber. What kind of coatings are those on that? Teflon. No, it's not Teflon. You, you can't make omelets on it. No, sorry, it's not Teflon. It's some kind of a, what is the whole point of coatings on these stealth bombers? What makes it stealth? It cannot be seen on a radar, so it's, trans, it's kind of invisible to radar. Those coatings do not reflect back. They do not give you a radar signal. That's what makes them different. Energy engineering. Solar cells is huge. How many of you have solar panels on your house here? Hmm. One, two, OK. So it's solar, solar cells, why is it solar important to us? Because about an hour's worth of sunlight that reaches the Earth can totally power our entire lifestyle for our human beings in the entire world for a whole year. So solar cells, solar is the most important form of energy. We are still trying to harvest it. We are still trying to come up with new materials that can actually accept it and convert that solar energy into electrical energy into more efficient forms. We are now with this crystalline silicon, and we have gone into second generation of cadmium telluride and amorphous silicon. But there's still more work to be done. The highest efficiency silicon cells work at about 18%, which means they convert about 18% of the sunlight incident on them. So there's still 82% remaining that's not being converted. So there's a huge amount of research that can be done to develop these new solar cells. Who, do, who develops those solar cells? Material science engineers. Material scientists develop these kind of new solar cells. Energy, again, wind turbines. This blade is 126 meters, which is about 420 feet. Does anybody here know what is the center field length in Yankee Stadium? 408 feet. It's shorter than this, wind, it's, than this blade. So if ARR hits a home run and they show it on this TV for three times or four times, that's still shorter than this blade by about 12 feet. And by the way, the center field, those, don't, those of you who don't know about the Yankee Stadium, is the longest in the Yankee Stadium. You can also have stealth wind turbines. Why? Because the UK government, UK is a small country, and they have a lot of defense uh, installations. They said it affects their radar systems. Nuclear. One of the most easily accessible sources of energy current day to replace fossil fuels is nuclear. And at UNR, we actually have a huge nuclear program. And material science has a materials, nuclear materials emphasis program. In the last year, there are around 700 engineers hired by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to actually review applications submitted for nuclear reactors. 700 engineers just to review applications submitted for nuclear reactors. And their starting salaries were in the order of six figures or more. And that's from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission of the United States. Nuclear materials emphasis is actually a pro materials emphasis option is in material science and engineering here. And what you're seeing there is a new supercritical reactor that's currently being installed as we speak in my lab in LMR. What we can do with this is study materials failure at extreme conditions, conditions which are in supercritical part of your spectrum, which is above 500 degrees Celsius and about 26 megapascals of pressure. 
atmospheric pressure by comparison is about 0.1 megapascals. Civil, where do materials play into civil? Well, you have buildings. Can you make them all solar cells with the wind windows? Yes, you can. How can you make them transparent and solar? Those are research into building integrated PV materials. Electronics. Let's see whether we can get this video to play. A transistor is the fundamental building block of all modern electronics. Intel has developed a new generation of transistors that are so small, about 400 of them could fit on the surface of a single red blood cell. Smaller transistors mean smaller processors, and smaller processors mean smaller computers. In fact, Intel will fit more than 400 million of the new transistors on their multi-core processors later this year. Let's take another look. Transistors are the tiny switches that process the ones and zeros of the digital world. The gate turns the transistor on and off. Underneath is an insulator, which keeps the current flowing the way it's supposed to. As developers have tried to shrink the transistor ever smaller and smaller, a problem developed. The current leaked through the too small insulator, resulting in power loss in the form of heat. Intel has discovered a new combination of materials called 45 nanometer high K metal gate, which fixes this problem. It means less power wasted, and that's good for you and the planet. It also means that we can shrink the transistor to ever smaller sizes. That means smaller, more powerful technology that fits in with your life. Electronics, 45 nanometers, and we have actually gone below that. It's now 32 nanometers. And with that 32 nanometers, is a, you're using that. That's all based on developments in materials. You need conductors. You need insulators. That's all, once again, based on materials. Things get smaller and smaller. Your iPod generation 5 now carries 64 gigabit, which is smaller than your first generation at 10 gigabit. So materials make them smaller. Therefore, you can have better technology. Mechanical, again, mechanical engineering, you, have, you need materials to make things smaller. And this is so small that there's actually a bug in it. It's called a microelectromechanical systems. These are really small systems that can actually do, you can access them in sensors, you can send them into a um, lot of small areas that needs to be investigated or studied. Biomedical engineering, this is once again uses a significant amount of materials, which are all developed by material scientists and engineers. What is that? A stent. All right, so you have a stent. You could put it in, and you can open up your areas. If you have atherosclerosis, a pig heart valve, dental implant, hip implant, made of different materials, ceramic coating, titanium, and which allows the bone to integrate into the implant. These are examples of how material science plays a role in biomedical engineering. To help beings that are big and small, and marine animals. Environmental engineering. This is, once again, a video from my lab, our research, and what we can do with materials to clean up the environment. There are two identical bottles. The one on the left has bacteria in it, the one on the right does not. And you will see in real time, within about 30 seconds, nanoparticles of palladium are found in the one with the bacteria. What do these nanoparticles of palladium do? You can use them, and that's how they look, nanoparticles of palladium, and those are the bacteria, those are long rods, and those are the nanoparticles of palladium, and you can see one bacterium with several particles of palladium on it. What does it do? It can remove pollutants, which are recalcitrant to be removed. When you have the palladium, you actually can remove it in a matter of minutes, which might take hours. And this is an accelerated experiment. So in real life, some things might take two months or three months to remove from your environment, from your drinking water. You can remove it in matters of minutes or hours. Nanotechnology. No talk will be complete without materials going to nanotechnology. These are all cadmium selenide quantum dots. Just by say, changing the size of these particles, you can change the color. 
they're all the same material except that the ones on the left are closer to two nanometers, ones on the right are closer to five nanometers. That changes the color. They are all dependent on material properties. Nano silver is actually you, many of you might be using it. Some of you might knowingly use it. Some of you may not be knowing that you are using nano silver. Nano silver is something that actually is an antibacterial. It's coated in refrigerators. Your Samsung refrigerators have nano silver. Dish, um, Laundry machines have nano silver so that your clothes don't get mold on them in case you forget to remove them before you go somewhere. There are a lot of things. Even pans have nano silver on them. So let's say that on a day on a day-to-day -day basis you want to exercise and you go you want to go on a bike ride. Your bike frame is made from carbon nanomaterials. You put on some sunscreen, which is not the chalky white kind, it's a transparent one, because the titanium dioxide that's used is nanotitanium dioxide. It's not regular titanium dioxide. And then to give yourself some energy, you drink a shake, but those shake, the cocoa particles are made in nano size so that it gives you a better taste and you are not going to be needing that much sugar to taste it. You put on your nano silver containing t-shirt so that when you sweat, the t-shirt doesn't smell. You put on nano silver containing socks, therefore your socks don't smell when it's wet. You come home, you do the laundry in your machines, which again have nano silver so that those clothes don't get moldy in case you don't remove them. Your refrigerator, you make some Chinese food on a tray which is coated with nano silver so you don't have to wash it. And then you can store it in the refrigerator with nano silver so it doesn't get mold on the food. If you do all these things and you use cooking ware that doesn't need to be cleaned and clothes that doesn't need to be washed, I don't know what kind of a social life you will have, but that's probably something that you probably wouldn't want to do on an everyday basis. So I'd like to finish in these complete with these two slides. My own background, I've shown you how versatile material science is. My bachelor's degree is in chemical engineering, my master's is in biomedical engineering, and my PhD is in material science and engineering. And they're all on a unifying theme. Materials makes them all, there are several areas of each one of those fields that are dependent on materials. And the 2010 and 2011 Nobel Prizes were won for materials research. And with that, I will Stop, and if you have any questions, you can ask me. All right, thank you. This is the clicker for this moves it forward and backward? Uh, or is it is there enough? That is the clicker. Oh, okay. Ah okay. this goes in my pocket. <laughs> I think I got it. Can you hear me okay? Good. Okay, my name is Alan Fuchs and I'm chair of chemical and materials engineering. So um, the department that Dr. Chittimbaram is in uh, is chemical and materials engineering, and he's in the material science and engineering program. So we have two programs in the department. And I'm going to talk to you about the chemical engineering side of the department. Um, but um, I'm in charge of both sides. So if any of you have questions about either chemical engineering or material science and engineering, you're welcome to come by and visit with me. And uh, you're also welcome to visit with the faculty in the program. So it was a very interesting survey that was taken right at the beginning of the class, uh, which is your second favorite um, engineering discipline. And I didn't see the, the uh, previous analysis that was probably done. Uh, how many of you guys um, are planning on entering into material science and engineering? OK. And how about chemical engineering? OK. OK. So. Um, this is a presentation that we put together um, with some students from chemical engineering. And um, the students have called themselves the engineering elites. So um, that's uh, an area that I think uh, they showed they were pretty excited about. OK, this first slide is very wordy. So let me go through uh, some of the words on this slide. Um, chemical engineering um, is a broad discipline. And it deals with processes we often call uh, chemical engineering a systems engineering approach. It's focused very much on the notion of um, unit operations. Have any of you ever heard of the term unit operations? And do any of you know what that is? 
Okay, that's not surprising. Actually, the central laboratory in our department and our building is a unit operations uh, laboratory. And what it is is it's a series of individual processes that are used typically that could be used to make up a chemical plant. So it's based on processes that may be both industrial and or natural. Uh, there's been much more emphasis in recent years on natural processes, processes that are related, for example, um, to bioengineering or biomedical engineering. And in chemical engineering, um, a new field has been emerging that's being called biomolecular engineering because chemical engineers associate very strongly with molecular engineering processes. These involve the transformation, which may be chemical, biological, or physical kind of processes. And transformation is a critical piece of chemical engineering and differentiates itself from other fields of engineering because chemical processes transform one species of chemical into another. Okay, that's not true really of any of the other engineering disciplines with the possible exception of environmental engineering and material science and engineering. But as I mentioned, there's a lot more emphasis on biological. Uh, matter or energy is, is con uh, transferred or transformed. And this is done for the benefit of mankind in an economical manner uh, without compromising the environment, safety, or finite resources. There's been a huge emphasis in the last couple of years on safety, process safety. And um, that's the reason for that is because it's so important in industry. Okay, so uh, what relates to that is that uh, the use of science, mathematics, specifically chemistry, biochemistry, I should add physics to that, um, applied math and engineering principles to take laboratory or conceptual ideas and turn them into value-added products in a cost-effective and safe manner. So um, these are essentially operational defi definitions of chemical engineering. And, um, whoop, can I skip something there? Okay, so what are some of the reasons why you might want to consider chemical engineering? And it looks like a number of you are. So um, I would say that there's a very good job market in general. Uh, as you guys know, the job market has been affected the last couple of years. But there's still a very good job market out there. There's some new developments that I would be happy to talk about. Um, for example, in this state, there's been a lot of activity uh, related to metallurgy and the mining industry. Uh, one thing I should mention also uh, related to Dr. Chittaburam's talk is that in our department, we have a lot of integration between chemical engineering and material science and engineering. It turns out that of the five faculty in the chemical engineering uh, program, four of us do research in materials. My own research is related to polymer materials. So some of the skills that are applicable to non-engineering fields are uh, important in chemical engineering. There are opportunities for continuing education and upper management, and there are great chances of um, securing financial aid, and our students claim that they're bragging rights. So where do chemical engineers go when they go into industry? Uh, well, this is nationwide, and um, many of them go into the oil industry, and certainly the oil industry has picked up. Do any of you know what area of the oil and gas industry has picked up in the last couple of years? Yeah, natural gas. Who said that? How do you get natural gas out of the ground? Any idea? Does anybody know there's a new technology that's used for pulling natural gas out of the ground? Anybody heard of it? I heard it in the front row here. Fracking, right? So fracking is a, is a way that people use, essentially, they create little shock waves. They put earthquakes into the ground, and what comes out is natural gas. And it turns out that the price of natural gas has really gone down because of all the natural gas that has been discovered recently due to fracking. And I believe this is going to be a real game changer over the next five to 10 years. I think you're going to see new processes coming out. Um, I was just up in Elko this week visiting Barrick, and they're really excited because they're bringing a natural gas line into the mining area, and it's going to really change their cost structures. So in terms of renewable energy and alternative energies, um, look for uh, natural gas uh, to be a game changer. Uh, chemicals and allied products are a major area. A uh, number of uh, chemical engineers contract. Pharmaceuticals, I believe, is a great area in chemical engineering, and it's going to be growing. Um, people go into business, finance, people consult. There's your energy area. 
uh, food and drink. Water is a, a major area. Um, being able to generate high quality water for semiconductors and drinking water is a major area. So, and a few people go into education. Okay, so what's unique about chemical engineering? Um, some chemical engineers would argue that uh, we are the universal engineer because we bring together uh, principles of, of all of the major science areas, uh, chemistry, biology, physics, mathematics, and in some ways, um, we, we have similar types of overlap with mechanical engineering, civil engineering, and the like. Um, it's required in, in addition to the other areas of engineering to have a knowledge of mass transfer and uh, generally um, in the past chemical engineering has been the highest paid salary for a four-year degree. Um, this often flip-flops with computer science and engineering and I found a, a number at the end I'll show you. But I don't recommend anybody go into a field uh, for the money. I recommend you go into it because you like it. My suggestion. So what are some of the areas of research? You're going to see there was a lot of overlap with what Dr. Chidambaram presented. Um, nanotechnology is an important area. Uh, this is relating to science and technology of uh, building devices from single atoms and molecules. So again, that's where the molecular engineering pieces come in. Um, certainly those of you that are interested in chemistry, um, this is a natural area to think about, building up structures from the molecular level. Very, very exciting opportunity. Renewable energy has always been an energy in general. This is why I actually went into chemical engineering when I was an undergraduate student like you guys. Um, when I was there, uh, it was a long time ago, and we were in the first energy crisis where gasoline prices, believe it or not, went up from about 30 cents a gallon to a buck a gallon. And I believed that by going into the energy area and going into chemical engineering, that I would work in that area for my entire career. Well, ironically, when I got into chemical engineering, um, the, the price of gas had stabilized, and I didn't work at all in energy until five years ago. But what's unique about chemical engineering is that because of the principles that you learn, you're able to work in many different areas. So I worked in the area of uh, polymeric materials, specifically related to membranes for separation for most of my career in industry. And an area that I've seen growth, steady growth in throughout my whole career, and I believe will continue to grow, is the area of drug delivery and um, bioengineering, biomolecular engineering. And so um, I encourage you guys to think about that as well. A little bit more on nanotechnology. Um, I myself have worked on a project related to cancer therapy where we have developed multifunctional materials. These are materials that have a polymeric backbone and on them we place functionalities that can be interacted for um, targeting of disease, uh, looking for tumors, killing those tumors, and um, a, a variety of different functional uses can be identified. And these sometimes are called nanobots because they're robotic in nature. Um, renewable energy, here's just a few areas in renewable energy that chemical engineers get involved in. Um, solar energy, Dr. Chidambaram mentioned, um, is an area that material scientists and engineers work in. We have faculty in chemical engineering as well. Um, actually, this is an area that I believe we're going to get a large boost in here at the university because we've just hired a new director of our renewable energy center and his area is solar energy. So we're, we're very excited. Of course, the state has a lot of sunshine, especially in the southern part of the state. So we look forward to seeing that as a growth area. Um, an area that um, not that many chemical engineers work in, but, but some very illustrious ones do, is geothermal. And that's an area that we're considered um, the Saudi Arabia of the United States in geothermal. Um, and then uh, biodiesel is an area that chemical engineers, biofuels and biomass is an area that is of great interest in chemical engineering. Um, it very closely relates to the area of catalysis. So we have two faculty in the department that are working on, uh, bio, uh, on biofuels. Um, uh, that would be Hong Fei Lin and um, Chuck Coronella, who also works on biomass. And a related area of catalysis is an area that Robbie Subramanian works on mainly related to solar energy. And um, wind energy has a little bit of a connection through those propellers that Dr. Chitter 
Brum showed you, and those are usually polymeric materials. So um, another area that's not mentioned here that I work in is storage, which relates to fuel cells and batteries, and developing new materials and process around those is a renewable energy. I actually just heard on the news today that as we are beginning to move out of this recession, that it's expected that there's going to be a major pickup in this energy area again. And this area was really picking up as we headed into the recession, right? That's why you guys have heard a lot about it. It's probably on your mind. But uh, this recession has really slowed up development in these areas. And it'll be interesting to see how this new development of fracking and natural gas plays into to this area. Do any of you guys know um, the main use for coal in the United States? Coal is an area um, that is, it's, coal is used quite a bit. Where is coal used mostly? Anybody know? Yeah, good. Where? What is it? I can't hear. Say, in the steel industry. Actually, um, coal is used in general. It, it is used in the steel industry. It's used in power plants, in, in um, power production industry. And so um, it looks like, and one of the problems with sol coal is that it has sulfur in it. And sulfur um, can be quite polluting. And so that's been a challenge in dealing with the cost structure of coal. And that's why people believe now that um, as natural gas comes in, many industrial plants for electricity production are going to be converted over to natural gas and replace coal. So that's an exciting development. I talked a little bit about drug delivery and um, synthesis. Uh, an area that I worked in, in industry related, I mentioned to you, related to membranes. Um, and I worked for a company that made membranes that could be used for hemodialysis, which is an area that's used for people with kidney disease. Um, there are other applications. Um, it can be used for transdermal drug delivery. It can be used for biodegradable uh, polymer systems. So um, this is an area that is very exciting. Um, it, relate, it, it relates to um, opportunities in our med school. And so um, what are research opportunities for undergraduate students? Uh, we encourage undergraduate students to think about getting involved in research. It's a great opportunity for students to learn about how research works, to interact with um, older students, graduate students, postdocs. So the first two are areas that I've worked in. Um, fuel cells uh, use what are called proton exchange membranes. This is an area that falls under intelligent materials. Those are materials whose properties change under the influence of a magnetic field. Um, I also teach our senior design class. And our senior design class for both chemical engineers and material scientists and engineers is used um, to interact with industry. So we have projects with NASA Ames for creating carbon nanotubes. Um, we work with Genentech in South San Francisco for a fermentation of monoclonal antibodies, which are used for cancer therapy. That's a bioseparation process. Um, we've worked on projects with biodiesel and green fuels and more. So here's an example in fuel cell technology, how a membrane is used in order to convert um, hydrogen and oxygen into electricity. And this can also be used for methanol. And now people are also interested for propane and natural gas uh, fuel cells, which tend to be higher temperature. And those are called solid oxide fuel cells. Again, this is, uh, I mentioned, an application of intelligent materials. And this can be used to. Um, create a, uh, a damper system that's used for vehicular applications. I've collaborated with mechanical engineering department in this area, Faramars Gordanajad, who works on uh, intelligent devices. Carbon nanotubes, uh, here's an example where NASA is planning on building an elevator to the moon. And uh, when they do that, they're going to do it using carbon nanotubes, which right now are the strongest material known to man. And in part of our um, design class, we designed a reactor which allowed us to use a fluidized bed to uh, create carbon nanotubes in a, in a very scalable method, a method that could be used to make kilogram quantities rather than just gram or subgram quantities. So there's your elevator to the moon. Fermentation, we've worked with uh, Sierra Nevada Brewery, and uh, this has been a very popular project in order to learn how to do fermentation and bioprocessing. Oops, did I skip one? Bioseparations in our project with Genentech, uh, we work on processing uh, monoclonal antibodies in order to purify and concentrate those 
uh, antibodies, and those are used to um, treat macular degeneration um, because they block the pathways of that disease. Biodiesel and green fuels, uh, this is a process that's in our unit operations laboratory, and we can create it from organic matter. So here's the curriculum in chemical engineering. Um, there are four what are known as emphasis areas. We have biomedical, process, energy, environmental, and I mentioned that we have close linkage with material science and engineering. These are the areas that you'll learn about. Uh, they focus on math, chemistry, physics. And I mentioned to you I would show you a um, salary number. The one I found, the most recent one, is for less than one year experience, and that's 51K. But go into an engineering field that you're interested in, not for the money. That's all I have to say. Any questions about chemical engineering or material science and engineering? Yes? Um, what we did, um, and actually we're not running it this year, but we've run it in the past for a number of years, is that we worked with NASA Ames and we did the research here, and it was done as part of the senior design project. Any other questions about chemical engineering or material science and engineering? Okay, my office is in LME, I'm in 307. If anybody wants to come by and ask questions, I'm, I'm available. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're, we're pretty much done for today. Um, I just wanted to make one last announcement. For the people who normally sit in the remote classroom, we're not going to be using that for the rest of the semester. We had too many problems with the audio. So uh, please plan to come in over into this room. So we're done for today. We'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>